Muito boa noite a todos. Em nome da Fundação Serralves, dou-vos as boas-vindas a mais esta conferência deste ciclo das Tendências Globais 2030, Futuros para Portugal. Hoje temos o privilégio de voltar ao assunto da governação mundial num mundo policêntrico, mas desta vez numa outra perspectiva, a perspectiva do outro lado do mundo e que no título são consideradas as potências emergentes. Elas já eram potências antes de serem emergentes, nós é que tínhamos uma, uma forma diferente de olhar para estes assuntos. Temos hoje aqui duas pessoas com pensares distintos, a senhora Rad Kumar, que vem da União Indiana, é uma pessoa, um intelectual, que sempre tem preocupações das temáticas de igualdade de género e da luta contra a violência. Foi fundadora de um think tank em Nova Delhi, no centro Nelson Mandela, e que se preocupa justamente com estas temáticas. E foi alguém que o governo da União Indiana convocou por mais de uma vez para missões de grande complexidade, de negociação que envolvia paz, nomeadamente em alguns estados da própria União Indiana. Uma pessoa hábil, que tem uma experiência, tem obra publicada e que nos pode dar o seu testemunho a partir da, da Índia. Por outro lado, temos o Dr. João Gomes Carvinho, doutorado em Oxford em Ciência Política, foi professor na Universidade de Coimbra, foi secretário de Estado da, dos Negócios Estrangeiros e da Cooperação, portanto isto antes de 2011. Depois foi, concorreu e foi escolhido para embaixador da União Europeia e teve um mandato na Índia, justamente entre 2011 e 2015, e atualmente é embaixador da União Europeia no Brasil, desde julho deste ano. É uma pessoa que tem experiência, experiência de académico, experiência de pensador, experiência diplomática, experiência política, portanto, e que nos pode dar uma ideia muito interessante da sua vivência nestes dois grandes países. Como moderador, um amigo meu, o professor Nuno Severiano Teixeira, eu conheci-o como presidente do Instituto de Defesa Nacional, portanto, direi nos anos, final dos anos 90, não é? Por aí. Eu, na altura, pertencia à Comissão de Recrutamento dos Auditores de Defesa Nacional, Fizesse, pertencia a essa comissão durante cerca de 10, 10 anos ou 20 anos, é uma outra história. Foi uma reclamação feita aqui no Norte, o curso de defesa nacional era só em Lisboa e passava-se durante todos os dias da semana e constituiu-se uma comissão aqui no, no Norte que foi ter como Ministro da Defesa dizendo que era necessário considerar que a partir do Porto podia haver um polo do Instituto de Defesa Nacional. Fomos atendidos e, e depois de castigo tivemos que ficar nessa comissão. Pessoas como eu, o professor Carvalho Guerra, o Engenheiro Almir de Azevedo, o um reitor da Universidade do Porto, mas foi uma experiência muito interessante que me aproximou das temáticas da defesa. O professor Nuno Severiano Teixeira depois foi ministro da Administração Interna, num governo em que eu também tive o privilégio de pertencer, e depois ministro da Defesa, portanto teve também uma experiência governativa muito interessante, mas fundamentalmente é um académico, é professor universitário na Universidade, na Universidade Nova de Lisboa, é atualmente vice-reitor e é especialista em relações internacionais. Portanto, temos aqui um conjunto de pessoas que nos permite antecipar um serão muito interessante de debate sobre justamente o tema desta conferência. Muito obrigado a todos e muito obrigado aos nossos convidados por terem vindo. Uh, boa noite, good evening. This session will be in English. Uh, I am going uh, today to give you some data about the topic that we are dealing with. The topic that we are dealing 
with is a topic that we have started discussing on the first of this series of conference. Are we moving to a polycentric world? Are we ahead in a polycentric world with a numerous number of actors, big powers, small powers, medium powers, no state actors, cities, all playing a role in the international arena? And what are the implications of this for global governance and for multilateralism? That's what we are going to discuss. Now, are we really moving to a polycentric world? Are we assisting to a relative decline of the United States and, and Europe and the rise of Asia, as it is said every day in the news and in most of the global trends reports. That's the co conviction or the conclusion that we are moving towards a world where the center of this world will be somewhere on the border between China and India. If this is the case, why it is the case? And let me show you four slides that have to do with this trend of moving towards Asia or moving to a, a more polycentric world, if you want. The first one, that's perhaps the most important global trend of our times, is the rise of a global middle class. It's the fact that most of the population of India, China, Brazil, will be out of poverty and will be part of a middle class. We are speaking of a middle class, defining as middle class, and this, of course, is part of the debate. And, uh, certainly the speakers will question this data, is that we are speaking of middle class, people that will have a salary of 10 to $100 a day. What this means is that they are out of poverty. Uh, they are not, no more starving. And they are able uh, to eat, to feed themselves, to feed their children, and send the children to school. Now, this middle class, as you see there, is very impressive. Uh, you have Asia with almost 3 billion people in middle class in 2030, according to Goldman Sachs uh, projections. That's the projection that I'm showing here. And you have this uh, rise uh, very exponential in Asia. Uh, and we have a certain decline of middle class in Europe. That has to do with the decline of European population, not because the European middle class went to poverty. It's because of the decline of European population. And you have the same in North America in a certain sense. And you have the rise also of middle class in Latin America. In Brazil, where, from where João Cravinho comes now, uh, 60 million people came out of poverty in the last 20 years to, to be part of this new middle class. Now, so this would be, from a middle class point of view, the, uh, the 2030 and the 21st century will be an Asian century. Century. Now, uh, the second slide uh, shows this from a GDP, uh, from a GDP perspective. And there you have China as the major economic power of 2030, with uh, around 23 20, almost 24% of global GDP, of share of global GDP, with the United States second with around 17%, per, 17% and the, the, the European Union, the states of the European Union, altogether around 14%, so you see a clear decline because Europe today is still the major economic power in terms of, of share of global GDP, and India rising to around 10% of global GDP, share of global GDP. Now, we are speaking of GDP, and many people tell me when I present this data, but GDP has no meaning. There's many other dimensions, you know, military power, technological power, and other forms of power. And, and population certainly, certainly plays also a role. Now, the third slide shows what is called material power. This index is a mix of different uh, dimensions of power, economic power, military power, technological power, and population. And even that, if you take in consideration all those dimensions, according to the most of the projections, uh, you will have still China as number one, one power in 2030, uh, with a relative decline of the US and the European Union, and a rise of India that is according to some, by the year 2050, but what will happen in 2050, nobody knows, 
Uh, India will be the number one power in terms of economic and perhaps even material power. Now, this of course makes a bright picture of the future for Asia, but there are a number of problems. And my second part of what I want to show to you are the problems of Asia. And the first, that is very important, uh, is uh, this is a projection of water scarcity. Where you see red is water scarcity. Uh, from the impact of climate change, you have a, an area of the world where water scarcity will be enormous, is already a problem, will be enormous problems, problem in the year 2030 and beyond that. And in particular, this is very important for this discussion of the Asian century, is that the, pro the major problem of water scarcity will be somewhere in the border between China and India. And this, of course, can create big problems between China and India, and we don't know what are the implications, all the implications of that. Now, this extraordinary development of Asia is done under a system that is called turbo capitalism, you know, wild capitalism. And the implications of turbo capitalism for the everyday life of people are very complex. And there is a lot of revolt and violence, uh, in particular in China, but certainly also in India and, and in Brazil. You know, in Brazil, there's 40,000 people killed every year. 40,000 is enormous. And in China and India, violence is every day, part of the everyday life. And I want to show to you the trailer of a movie that I don't know if any of you have seen, but if you have not seen, I will advise you to see. You'll see at the end of the, of the movie, it's, it's, in the trailer, it says, coming soon. I don't know if it's coming soon to Porto, I don't think so, but if you'll come soon, it will be great. It's a, a movie from a very famous, perhaps the most famous Chinese living uh, film director that called Jian Zheng Ke, and the, the movie is called touch of, A Touch of Sin. And what has done, Jian Zheng Ke, and this is a good example of what is happening in China, he went to the Weibo. The Weibo is the Twitter, Chinese Twitter. And he has found in the Weibo four stories of extreme violence, of crimes, of uh, murder, provoked by the social situation. And uh, he made a, a, a movie around these stories. He went to the country, to the countryside, most of it is in the countryside, to discover why there was this extreme violence. And they made this as a reportage. Uh, he went, uh, he followed the people and he asked them why they were so violent and he made the movie. And this extraordinary movie that uh, uh, shows to you that under this extraordinary development of China and India and Brazil, there is a lot of violence going on. And of course the future, as I said in from, uh, from the beginning, we don't know what is the future. We're speaking of trends. But we know that the whole of the game is imprevisibility, is what I have called in the first conference, the black swans. So what's going to happen to China and to India? We cannot say. We know that with the present trends, China and India will be at the heart of the international system in 2030, and we would like to understand what are the implications for global governance and for multilateralism. But that I will leave with the speakers. Thank you very much. And I leave you with the trailer of
，凌晨一点一波。Good evening. It's working. The micro. Okay. Good evening. I'd like, first of all, to express my thanks uh, for this very kind invitation to be the moderator of this session uh, this evening. It's my great pleasure to be here today. Uh, thanks to Fundação Serralves and its uh, uh, president, my dear friend Engenheiro Braga da Cruz, and also the new. Uh, the future president, Dr. Ana Pinho, and of course to the curator of these conferences, uh, my friend Alvaro Vasconcelos. I would like also to congratulate you for this initiative, this very interesting initiative of thinking the Portugal's future, but thinking the Portugal's future not in the traditional way of thinking the Portugal's future. I mean, the traditional way is to think the future of the country in, the in a national basis. This is not to think the Portugal's future in a national basis or even in the, a European context, but in a larger context, the context of the trends, of the global trends. Based, I think, on two uh, documents published in 2012, one by European Union and directed by Alvaro Vasconcelos and the other uh, by United States, uh, where uh, the trends, the global trends 2030 are, uh, um, are taken in perspective, in the future perspective. Well, uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, make uh, two or three remarks about these global trends, trying to, to put in context our, our debate uh, uh, today. In these uh, uh, different global trends, I would like to stress two or three uh, of these uh, different trends. The first one uh, is the economic and, and financial concentration uh, in the hands of a very strict group, a very small group, uh, very rich and very powerful group, which uh, uh, in a certain way uh, has the consequence of uh, the predominance of the um, economic power, the financial power over the political power. So this is a, a long trend and this is also a concern for the future. The second one uh, is more optimistic if we can say, and is the empowerment of people. The empowerment of people and the enhancement of uh, the civil society due to the uh, more educated people, uh, due to the access, the, uh, uh, the increasingly access to the new technologies of communication and, and uh, uh, information, which give to the people uh, uh, more autonomy and more power. And finally, the third one is uh, uh, the crisis of the nation state. And at the same time, the increasing power of the uh, global networks. The question in this uh, trend is, uh, which is the future of the global governance? Is it possible a global governance 
or it is not possible a global governance in the future. What we are thinking is about uh, the international order or the global order, if we can say. During the Cold War, the global order was very clear. It was a bipolar system divided between the United States and the Soviet Union. And even in the post-Cold War period, the international order was quite clear. It was the unipolar moment of the United States. But today it's completely different. I mean, uh, the international order today is everything but clear. On the contrary, it's quite complex. And if you want to characterize this uh, global order and the trend for the global or international order, I would say that uh, we have three main characteristics, three main trends we are seeing. The new global order is multipolar. The new global order is uh, polycentric. And the new global order is also diffuse. I mean, uh, it's multipolar because uh, there is today uh, more than one pole structuring the international relations. Uh, it is polycentric because there, there is more than one center, and these different centers are geographically separated, geographically different in the, in the international order. And finally, diffuse, because there are different types of international actors today. Different types of international actors with different natures in its role in the international order. We have the big powers, the established powers, the global powers, if you want. We have the regional powers or the medium powers, the emerging powers. But still there, we have, we are talking about states. But there are at the same, there is at the same time, other kind of international actors with an increasing power in the international scene the multinational companies, the traditional intergovernmental uh, organizations, the cities, the big cities like New York or Tokyo or Singapore uh, that have a role in the international scene, or the transnational networks, just to say, for instance, the terroristic networks. So we have today different actors, different logics, and different dynamics in the internet, playing at the same time in the international scene. At least we have two different, uh, two different dynamics. On one hand, the dynamic of globalization. On the other hand, the dynamics of the states. I mean, we have a Westphalian dynamic and a global dynamic acting at the same times, at the same time, and even in a contradictory way. We have two different logics, at least. We have the logics of the established big powers, the dominant powers, and we have at the same time the logic and the perspective of the emerging powers. Are they revisionist or not? Are they uh, uh, trying to change the global order, or they, are they accommodating to the global order? So uh, this is our purpose today, this is our perspective, trying to see from the emerging powers, from the point of view of the emerging powers, which is uh, their perspective for the future of the international order. And we have two study cases, India, first of all, and Brazil in the second time. And we have the pleasure to have today, and I, 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 I don't need to make a presentation because uh, Engineer Braga da Cruz have already uh, made, this made this presentation, but let me say that we have uh, with us uh, Radha Kumar, who is the uh, president or director of the, the director 
of Delhi Policy Center. I am fortunate because very regularly I receive your documents. <laughs> uh, but it's a great pleasure to have you personally today. And also, uh, uh, Professor, Professor João Crevinho, a friend from a long time, uh, uh, who is now current uh, ambassador of EU in Brazil. So, um, <clears throat> I give the floor immediately to Radha Kumar. Thank you, Radha. No, it's working. Okay. Thank you so much, Nuno, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Sir Alvarez Foundation and Alvaro Vasconcelos for inviting me here. This is the first time I've been to this beautiful city, but I'm sure it won't be the last time. Um, the subject of today's discussion is very wide-ranging indeed, and I'm going to try if possible, to address the various challenging questions that have been put before us. Uh, first of all, the two Global 2030 reports were absolutely brilliant and got many of us thinking, uh, both the NIC report from the US and the uh, European Union Institute of Strategic Studies report that Alvaro led. Uh, and I think you've seen some of the questions that came out of those two studies. I looked up uh, the NIC to see what are they talking about for their 2035 report. As you know, they bring out one every five years. And here are the questions that they've asked. The first question is the same question that Alvaro began this evening with. Will power continue to diffuse or will it concentrate? in the future. To what extent will further advances in communications technology transform societies and the relationship between citizens and governments? That's the question you asked, no, no. Um, a third question I don't think I will be able to address at all, but I hope that some of you will address it, which is how will automation and robotics impact human employment and economies. This is a question that's very far away for us, but I presume is quite close for uh, the EU, perhaps, uh, EU countries, and certainly countries like Japan, it is very close. And finally, the question they asked is, what, which currently unresolved questions or uncertainties regarding society, economy, and politics are likely to be game changers? That's a huge question. Now, from where we stand, there are um, you know, two further questions. Uh, one regarding China, and the other regarding uh, whether the US rebalance to Asia does seriously indicate uh, an era of competition uh, between China uh, on one side and the US and Japan on the other side. And here, I think one of the deductions, at least from an Asian point of view, is that we seem to be seeing a kind of new G2 competition into cooperation issue arising for Asia and the Pacific, which is very different from the diffusion of power that we see perhaps in, uh, uh, in Europe, in large parts of the rest of Asia, uh, the smaller ASEAN countries, India, Indonesia, we are far more on the division of power element. Now, when I talk about uh, the US-China issues as far as the Asia Pacific is concerned, of course, Russia enters in that too. And, uh, uh, you know, an issue that we're looking at quite closely in India is to what extent is China sort of trying to reinvent the post-World War II order for the 21st century when they uh, create the Asian infrastructure uh, and investment banks, when they create the BRICS banks. BRICS is really led by China and Russia. When they do the entire infrastructure development in Central Asia, uh, which is now being combined increasingly with an attempt to galvanize the Shanghai cooperation 
organization, as a security organization. If you add up all these little bits, it does seem as if China itself is seeking a kind of um, uh, post-Cold War, if you like, or new 21st century division of, uh, of a great power order, not of a diffused, multipolar, polycentric world. And that's a question that we, we would have to look at very carefully. Uh, objectively, is it possible? Uh, you can say that all the counter trends uh, for China are the pressures that come from the other countries uh, of East Asia and Southeast Asia, which uh, certainly would like to have polycentric Asia Pacific. There's also a question that will come from India, uh, which would perhaps be more aligned with the Southeast Asian countries in looking for uh, cooperative models of, uh, of behavior, whether it is you know, a code of conduct for the seas, or whether it is how do we deal with global commons, or whether it is how we deal with ordinary real politic challenges for us in Central and West Asia. And those are three, three sort of strategic foreign policy issues that will continue, I think, to dominate our horizon. Having said that, what are the, what are the challenges for India if we even try to think of India as uh, a growing emerging power? Uh, which is what I think is, is predicated in some of the slides that you have looked at. I think that the main challenges for India today, or the questions, are first of all, can we achieve close to zero population growth by 2035? If our population keeps growing at the rate that we're growing, we are likely to have a very high level of social unrest in our country, and certainly it seems unlikely that no matter how well we grow, even if we can maintain a 7-8% to 8 rate of growth, we are not going to be able to, uh, to cope with the rate of growth of the population. We are on, finally now on a declining population growth rate, and so hopefully we should be able to find some equilibrium in another 20 years. More importantly, can India raise its very, very poor sex ratio? India has 940 women per 1,000 men. If we want to grow, and if we want to move from being an emerging to an emerged power, it, uh, there's no question at all. But there have to be rapid improvements in this sex ratio. Um, in the past 10 years, due to government intervention, we were able to actually go up from 930 to 940, which is quite, quite large, if you can manage a 10%, uh, sorry, 10 points growth in your sex ratio. Can we think of a challenge whereby we can grow 20 points per, per decade? If we can do that, then by 2035, we should at least be in the range of 985 or so to a thousand, which will give us greater element of stability at the base. Uh, it's quite interesting, you look at recent reports, the McKinsey Global Institute and a series of other international consulting and analytical companies have made this point over and over again, that India's loss in terms of economic GDP or purchasing power parity, whichever point at that scale you want to look at it. Uh, the loss is in the tens of billions, the lack of uh, the poor sex ratio and the lack of focus on productive employment for women is leading to this huge, huge uh, um, loss to the exchequer. <coughs> Will India be able to bring its growing middle class? Well. I have a more modest target, Alvaro, than yours, but can we even move from somewhere around 200 million in our middle class to somewhere around 400? Can we double our figures? Which is certainly an ambition. If we can take the kind of definition that Alvaro is using, then perhaps, perhaps we can certainly move that many people out of poverty and towards education. But you have a further problem. We have a huge education deficit. We simply don't 
Uh, we don't have the teachers. Whether it is the higher education, the academic level, or whether it is vocational education, which uh, in a way provides a bulwark of the skills required to offer healthcare, to offer um, um, basic living standards to people. We don't have the people there to actually teach or train. So here's a huge investment that is required. The good news is that I think India can afford to make that investment. Uh, the question mark is can we attract people to come and help us set up these institutions of skilling and learning that are required in our country? Um, you know, some countries are beginning to invest in us in those terms, Germany being one. But I imagine that the government of India would need to look for a much larger range of, uh, of potential skills, uh, skilling uh, opportunities and techniques to do that. How are we going to handle our environmental problems? Uh, the question of water scarcity was referred to. But along with water scarcity is our huge need for energy. Um, our Prime Minister just unveiled a very ambitious solar and wind energy plan to raise uh, our levels of energy uh, uh, production from something like 4,000 to 16,000 megawatts in a period of uh, five, five to ten years. Is this achievable over a 20-year period? If it is, then again, this would be a good news story for us to begin to emerge uh, um, as, as a real power. But it's not clear whether we will. Water harvesting, water management, river interlinking, cleaning up embankments, the range of tasks is, is really very large. What we do see is local level efforts, but we don't see those local level efforts as yet becoming uh, state and national level efforts in our country. So that will be another challenge for us. Most important of all, we're a young country. More than 40% of our population is below the age of 30. And in another 20 years, we'll be an even younger country with an even larger uh, uh, proportion of population. Some people think over 60%. Where are the jobs going to come from? At a conservative estimate, we need to create one million jobs a year just to deal with the current, the current entry of young people into the labor market. Uh, a month, a million jobs a month. Uh, how is this, is this task to be achieved? Uh, one big thrust that the government of India is looking at is urbanization. Now, uh, India, uh, for the past hundred years, only urbanized around big metropolitan agglomerations. But ten years ago, our government began to see that that pattern of development, uh, with a handful of large cities getting larger and larger and larger, and certainly influencing government policy in a disproportionate way, as you pointed out, for big international capitals um, was unwieldy. It could not sustain the kind of population that was coming. The infrastructure was not sufficient and nor were the services. But what we saw 10 years ago was a new policy thrust towards developing small and medium towns. And if that policy thrust can actually reach the 3,000 odd towns that are being talked about today, which will obviously in another five years have to become six and then 10 and then 20,000 small and medium towns around the country. If that can be made to work, then it would provide a huge impetus for uh, the rural sectors to grow. And that would certainly be able to bring us to a level of middle class existence that would mark uh, the emergence, I would say, of India regionally as well as globally. Now, that's the domestic part of it. Uh, as we all know, countries may not necessarily be either middle class or economically uh, well-balanced in order to play a disproportionate role in 
uh, strategic uh, uh, and uh, global uh, foreign policy um, matters. And I think India has tended to have that capacity to play a much larger role internationally than its actual weight permitted earlier. Today we have an interesting new different situation in that India actually has more weight both economically as well as in terms of its population and its growth and development curve. And so it can bring a substance to global roles, which interestingly we have a reversal of. We are tending not to play such a large global role as we did before, uh, while we are actually able to bring more weight to the table than we did earlier. Uh, why is that? I think part of it is that uh, somewhere along the line our political as well as uh, economic leadership uh, began to realize that if you really want to influence uh, events in such a way that you can improve both your own life and the standards of living of your citizenry at large, then, it, then you need to focus on developing yourself domestically and your foreign policies have to be brought in line with your domestic interests. As all of you I'm sure know, it's far more difficult to bring domestic and foreign policy uh, interests together in a productive way uh, while being challenged. Obviously, if you're a democracy, you are going to be challenged not only by your opposition, but by your media, by your intellectuals, and so on. It's, it's far more difficult then to, do, to bring these two things in line than it is to have a foreign policy uh, which reflects a certain leadership view of the country uh, without having to make it accountable domestically because it really doesn't have all that much to do with the domestic interests of your citizens. So here's the big challenge I would say for India is actually how to create a foreign and strategic policy that will match the domestic interests, that will be challenged, that will be held accountable, and yet that can keep progressing on from one to uh, you know from one step to the other to the other and it's a legitimate question that both the people of india and the uh, neighbors of india and the international community at large are asking india today is will you deliver it's a very legitimate question for us but it's also perhaps the most difficult question to be able to answer uh, when you are in this state of, uh, I cannot, I, I, I cannot uh, accurately say how important and how difficult this challenge of bringing these two policies in line is. And when you have that huge challenge ahead of you, it's a, a visionary challenge. If you can rise to it, it's amazing and wonderful, but it's very, very difficult and I'm not sure whether in this period of our international history, we have sufficient leaders uh, to rise to this type of challenge. And I don't mean it only in our own country. I don't see that leadership necessarily around the world that can, that can you know, take this one big idea just for India and say, okay, we're going to help you make this happen. Of course, we have to do it first. But it, it's to me unclear. Now, if, if my doubts are right and we will not have that emerging leadership to make this happen in the next 20 years, what can we envisage then? Uh, I don't think that we need to think that you're going to have a more fractured, a more difficult, a more violent India than we have today. I think actually that if you look at the rising aspirations of the people of India, uh, you have a certain consensus emerging in favor of generally, broadly speaking, middle class aspirations. Generally, broadly speaking, 
uh, in favor of better governance structures, an administration that works, a global system to which you are already connected economically and to which you want to connect in a wider way in terms of both uh, humanitarian ideals as well as shifting balances of power. Uh, now, if you have that kind of a consensus emerging at a broad level across your country, that should give you a capacity then to play a role irrespective of how far you can meet that challenge of domestic inter international policy. Is violence going to grow in India? I actually believe that for the first time in, in the past 10 years, you know, I'm 60 now, in the past 10 years, for the first time, I have seen uh, an expectation first from the women of India and then second from the minorities of India, an expectation that they have a right to demand security uh, from the police, from the economy, from the neighborhood. And that's, that's never been the case before. We were much more divided on what people thought they had a right to aspire to. So my sense is very optimistic. I think that if people across the spectrum are beginning to express this aspiration as a right, as an entitlement, we may go through upheavals, but that right will win out. Uh, we will have a more responsive, administrative, and uh, security, community security system than we have had in the past 50 years of our independence. <coughs> Should I? Stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Radha, for your very interesting uh, speech. Uh, I'm sure it will raise a lot of questions, so I give the floor immediately to João. Thank you very much, uh, Nuno. Uh, thank you to the Fundação Serralves. Engenheiro Braga de Cruz, da doutora Ana Pinho, uh, to my friend Álvaro Vasconcelos for inviting, and I'm very, very pleased to be on stage with uh, two friends, Nuno Severiano Teixeira, who uh, is a friend for many years, and, uh, and Rata, who is a friend more recently, but a very good friend from, from India and, uh, and a neighbor as well in India. And uh, it's, uh, having left the neighborhood, it's wonderful to, to be back in touch in, in Porto. A little bit strange for me in Porto to be speaking in English. Um, in, uh, in Brazil, I uh, speak in Portuguese, but people think I'm speaking a foreign language. So, <laughs> so maybe it's not so different. I'd like to uh, structure a few comments uh, uh, around uh, four themes. One, uh, reasons for the emergence of Brazil and the vulnerabilities associated to the emergence of Brazil. Two, reasons why I have doubts about uh, the relevance of the BRICS. Um, three, reasons for an affirmation of multipolarity in uh, the international system and for some comments on the relationship between multipolarity and multilateralism. On, uh, on Brazil, uh, I, I want to be telegrammatic. Uh, I want to say that uh, as Portuguese we all have, a, I think, a, a consciousness of the uh, potential of Brazil. There is always the joke about Brazil having a great future ahead of it, and the future is still always there. It's never quite, you never quite reached it. But in the last, uh, last decade, two decades, Brazilians have a sense that the future is coming closer, that the uh, ambitions that they have and that uh, people have had for so many years of, about Brazil are about to materialize. And there are, there are good reasons for this, although at this moment, at this specific moment in the last uh, couple of years, the next couple of years, there is also a sense of crisis, but I think that is a, a conjunctural crisis, a crisis uh, which is a fairly short-ranging crisis. The big uh, reasons for thinking about Brazil as having a bright future are still there. 
a couple of, of uh, statistics. One statistic that struck me is that in the next 25 years, the world population is expected to grow from 7 to 9 billion. The extra food that is required to feed 2 billion more people, uh, about 20-25% of that food will come from Brazil another 20-25% from the United States, and the rest from around the world. So that is, a, I think, an illustrative uh, fact about the relevance of Brazil, the growing relevance. As resources around the world become scarcer, a country that has so many resources still to explore becomes more prominent and more valuable. Energy-wise, as well, Brazil has enormous uh, uh, potential. As in both in carbon and foss uh, fossil fuel and in uh, renewable energy. Uh, water resources, if they are better managed, uh, are, are not a problem for Brazil as they are in other parts of, of the world. Um, the population, which is always the biggest asset that the country has had, the population of Brazil, like uh, Rada has said about, about India, is a population that is growing in its level of demand. Demand uh, about what it uh, believes it has a right to. It's a population that has uh, uh, joined this so-called middle class in large numbers. Uh, Alvaro mentioned 60 million in the last uh, couple of decades. But we, we have to understand two or three things about that. One is that this is a very precarious middle class. It is a middle class that is not starving, but it is a middle class that is not far from starving if things go wrong for a not very long period of time, for some months, a year, and uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, their escape from poverty is put into question. So it's a precarious middle class. But at the same time, it is a middle class that has the capacity to send its children to school. And uh, to this, this leads immediately in a democracy, which is not the case of all BRICS, of course. But in a democracy, this leads to a rise in the demand from the system, from the politicians, from the institutions. And Brazil has, I felt this very much, going from India to Brazil, has a very demanding a population. It's very problematic for the politicians knowing how to deal with these demands. But it's a very healthy sign. It's a sign that's good for democracy, it's a sign that is good for the institutions, and it's a sign that uh, people, uh, people believe in, in the right to a better future. Of course, if things go wrong, as they do sometimes, and we've seen big demonstrations in Brazil, then there is a lot of frustration and revolt uh, that can, can result. But if things go right, it's a major asset. The current situation in Brazil is one of a certain amount of, uh, uh, I think, um, depression amongst the population regarding their institutions. They don't believe in them. They particularly don't believe in the political class. Um, but at the same time, uh, the revelations that are producing this uh, sense of degradation of the institutions, the revelations that are coming about, come, coming from the, the scandals that are being investigated, these are revelations that are strengthening the institutions themselves. They are strengthening the judiciary and they are making the people much more aware of what they want from their politicians. So I, I see uh, the current situation also in a very positive way. Uh, it would be, I think, the situation five years ago in which everybody was happy, uh, ironically, it was a much worse situation because everybody was happy, but under the surface, we had all these terrible things that are now being revealed, they were happening. Now, uh, people are unhappy because they're finding out about these terrible things, but actually, uh, the terrible things are being, are, being, are being solved, they're being exposed, and I think that strengthens Brazil a lot, and it strengthens Brazil's capacity to project itself internationally, because if the institutions of the country work, then the country's credibility for investors uh, and its international image will improve greatly as well. Also, the geopolitical context of Brazil is a very favorable one. Uh, unlike India, which has major problems in the region, it has neighbors such as Pakistan and China. 
Brazil has 10 neighbors. It has not fought a war with any of those neighbors for 150 years. And so uh, this is a very, very privilege. There are few parts of the world where you see peace being the norm for such a long period of time. There is no expectation, no sense that in the future there might be a war with some neighbor. So it's a very peaceful neighborhood and this allows, of course, the country's energies to be, uh, to be spent on, on development and not on, uh, on, on uh, reducing the threat from, from enemies. So my impression after a few months of Brazil is that this is a country that has every reason, every right to believe that it will be increasingly important on the international scene. But it is a country that also has some vulnerabilities that need to be addressed, vulnerabilities in the education system, um, making it, as in, as in India as well, and Radha already mentioned this, the same situation in Brazil, making the fairly young population uh, capable of productive uh, future, the question marks in relation to that. There are uh, vulnerabilities with respect to the capacity to enact necessary reforms in the economic system. I, I believe that these reforms are, are possible. I believe it's more difficult to make other necessary reforms in the political system, which, uh, which are, are equally uh, relevant for the future of the country. So there are a number of challenges that the Brazilian leadership has to face up to. But all in all, I am a Brazilo optimist. I think that it should be much more significant in the, on the world stage in the future. BRICS. There I am much uh, less convinced that this uh, acronym that has been invented is a very relevant one. If we look at the grouping, there is not very much that keeps them together. Um, I, I see three th factors that they have in common, which each of them is, is, is a fairly weak one. The first one is a sense that their growing political power is a result of their growing economic capacity, and their growing economic capacity will be a result of state-led development. All of them have very strong statist ideas about uh, how to transform the country. And so whereas, as, as Nun mentioned in his introduction, in Europe we talk about the decline of the nation state and other parts of the developed world, we, we make these, uh, we, we, this is a focus of attention. There is no sense at all by the leadership or even the populations of the countries of the BRICS that we're talking about the decline of the nation state. For them, the nation state is very much the central actor of their future, their growing future, as they, as they see it. That's, that's a common characteristic of the BRICS, but it doesn't necessarily bring the BRICS close together um, <clears throat> on some subjects, such as reform of uh, international economic governance. It gives them a common basis, but it's not a very strong glue for the BRICS grouping. Are BRICS uh, revisionist, uh, as the, the question was, was posed? Yes, to a degree. Uh, yes, they want to reorganize world order up to a certain point. Um, they are not, uh, they do not want to, and I will mention, mention this a little later, uh, they do not want to completely put into question the order that they've inherited. They simply want a more important role in this world order. And the way that they want the world order to change is very different from bricks to bricks. Um, Brazil and India have a very, very powerful and intense interest in becoming permanent members of the Security Council in South Africa to a lesser degree. Russia and China are very happy with the way the Security Council is. So just to give one example of uh, their different insertions into the international system, l producing different notions about what aspects of world order they would like to change. Russia is perhaps, sorry, China is, uh, has a, a strong but very long-term sense of transformation of world order, transformation, not, a, not revolution. Russia 
is extremely contestatory of certain aspects of global order, in particular one aspect, which is that it does not accept that the former Soviet uh, republics, which are now independent, should be fully sovereign. This is something that Russia does not accept, wants to overthrow. But largely, these, uh, the BRICS countries are much more interested in simply affirming themselves more strongly in a modified international order than in radically transforming the international order. The third characteristic that BRICS have in common, or rather that BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa have in common, is that the relationship with China is much more important than the relationship with any of the other members of the grouping. So China is, a, is the central element of the BRICS. China is worth more than 50% of the BRICS, and the relationship that China has with each of them is the most important the rela relationship that each of them has inside the grouping, because otherwise uh, some of the other relationships are almost non-existent or, or very weak. But what does this mean, the relationship with China being the most important? It is not enough to mobilize. India has a notoriously complicated relationship with China. Uh, when China, when the BRICS countries began to talk about the development of a BRICS bank as a form of of course, of projecting their power. They had discussions for several years, and then they finally established the bank. And the criteria that was agreed by four, or imposed by four, uh, of the members of the BRICS was that everybody should have 20%. That was not the preference of China. So what is the result of the BRICS bank? The BRICS bank is as big as the smallest the least powerful country can afford, which is South Africa. So we're talking about a bank that is of the scale of an international South African bank, times five, but still a small scale. And within months, China had, after having to accept the inevitable, because they had four BRICS absolutely insisting, because they did not want China to do, dominate the BRICS bank, within months of that decision to set up the new development bank on those terms, we have China setting up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which will be a very serious um, newcomer on the banking scene, contrary to the case of the new development bank. Moving on to, I think that what I've said about BRICS and the affirmation of Brazil, and uh, Rada has spoken about the affirmation and the emergence of, of India, I think, allow us to uh, identify multipolarity as being the shape of things to come for a long time. This is the preference of, of the BRICS countries, clearly. This is what they want from the international system. They want it to have a larger voice, a larger state-centric voice in governing world affairs. They do not want anarchy. Um, and they are very keen that uh, multilateralism should be previously organized through multipolarity. I'll develop that in a moment. It struck me when I went to India in about 2006 or 7, uh, on behalf of the Portuguese government, the member of the Indian government with whom I held political consultations, Whenever I talked about Portugal's strong commitment to multilateralism, he would say, yes, I agree, we are also committed to multipolarity. And uh, that was an charmer. And uh, this, of course, is, is, is not a simple mistake. It's clearly an affirmation of a different, of a different vision. Um, the European Union, I should say, is also adapting itself to this, uh, I think, strong development of multipolarity, even though multilateralism is in the DNA of, of the European Union. The growing dysfunctionality of the international system that we've seen in, the, in recent years, though, is a matter of concern for emerging powers as much as for the status quo powers, the powers of the, of the West. And I think that this has revived a certain interest that we've seen in recent months in kind of great power arrangements, 19th century type 
great power arrangements, dialogues, discussions, conversations uh, behind, behind the uh, in the backstage, uh, in order to in order to seek to respond to growing disorder. And as I say, the BRICS are part of that process. This will not help us to solve issues, or rather, it will not avoid situations such as Libya or Syria, but it can help, I think, to, um, to, to, uh, to uh, work, work around them and to find solutions. So BRICS, I think, share an interest in reforming world order, but not in uh, destroying it. So they tend to be willing to cooperate in the management of multipolarity, of course, on their own terms, with appropriate respect, with appropriate uh, returns for, for, for their own interests. And these uh, 19th century arrangements are reappearing, but of course the 21st century is much more complex than the 19th century was. And this means that what we gained from the development of multilateralism in the second half of the 20th century will not disappear completely and in fact can be built upon but, uh, but in a way that I think uh, we, are, we should be less optimistic about than we were maybe 15 years ago. The relationship between multilateralism and multipolarity to, to finalize. In my view, this uh, depends on the, on the issue. But uh, to a large degree, I think multilateralism can be successful when there is already a certain density of multipolar, multipolar understandings. Uh, we've see, we're seeing this now, for example, in the climate change negotiations. Five years ago, we had this uh, monumental failure of a multilateralist solution in Copenhagen. In the last five years, we have had many bilateral understandings that hopefully will be the basis now for a multilateral arrangement in Paris. A weak multilateral arrangement and a multilateral arrangement much less ambitious than in the European Union we would have liked to see, but the one that is possible with the current um, predominance of a, of a multipolar system. Maybe the same will happen with world trade. Maybe uh, the failure of the Doha round, the failure of a reform of the international trading system will transform itself into a new international trading system through a number of interconnected bi-regional uh, trading arrangements, which some years down the road will be made into an international uh, system, global system. So there again, we have multipolarity as the basis for, for multilateralism. In some, in some uh, domains, such as the, perhaps the uh, arm tr arms trade, mm, we can expect to have, if there is sufficient convergence, to have um, multilateral arrangements working. I'm not sure, personally, if the non-proliferation uh, treaty will survive for a very long time in current circumstances, but it will be possible, I think, still to have a so fairly solid basis of multilateralism, uh, although, although always taking into account the distribution of power in a multipolar system. New forms of multilateralism can emerge, and already emerging, for example, in terms of the governance of the Internet. The governance of the Internet is not a classical United Nations uh, uh, organized uh, mechanism with countries going to a conference to decide upon a certain, a certain treaty. It is happen, happening in a different way, one which is actually much more promising. It's a multi-stakeholder. It recognizes the very, very landscape of international international, uh, the, the, the cyber society uh, today, and I think is being developed very successfully with the strong support of Brazil, uh, the, the not so strong, more recent support of India, but nevertheless the support of India, against Russia and against China, Chinese interests. Uh, so there we have a case where these emerging powers are clearly making a big difference in terms of, of something that is 
perhaps much more important than we imagine for, um, for, for global governance. So, in short, multilateralism is uh, present, going to remain present, perhaps developing new ways of making its presence felt, and perhaps gaining in density, but only when that is convenient for, for multipolar uh, power interests. The attachment to multipolarity implies a willingness to break the rules, which is something that is supposedly banned if one thinks of classic multilateralism, which is a, uh, a pooling of sovereignty, a, an abandonment of the, or an acceptance that we're going to follow a certain rules. Multipolarity is a reservation to that. It's a way of saying, let's do this, but I cannot guarantee that it is going to be forever. So we have a much more precarious, not an effective multilateralism as we had grown used to thinking of it, but uh, a precarious multilateralism. And I think that's what characterizes the times in, in, which we, in which we live and the relevance of the emergence of a number of countries such as Brazil on the international scene. Thank you very much, Juan, well, for your very stimulating speech, and particularly for this, for this topic, which I think is uh, one of the key issues for, for the near future, which is the relationship between multipolarity and uh, uh, multilateralism. There is the big difference between, in particular, Europe and the vision, and the European vision, and the uh, emerging powers vision, and it will last. Uh, in the next decades, I think. Well, uh, we have two excellent uh, speeches that I'm sure will raise questions, and I now I will give the, uh, the floor to uh, Jorge Tavares da Silva, which is, who, who is professor at the University of Minho. Uh, I would like to... Just a, just a moment, the micro... Good evening. Um, I agree with you. Uh, we uh, should not forget the role of China in this process uh, because it intends, in fact, to be the leader of the emerging uh, world. Uh, it's not intended to be the, lead, uh, the last one of the, um, the, the more important countries in the world, but the leader of the emerging countries in the world. But the point of view in the BRICS countries, or the emerging countries, if you prefer, is in fact the growth. They think that if they grow more than the others, in fact, they lead the process of the, 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 um, the governance if they, if it comes from the South uh, countries in the South. Uh, they defend a multipo multipolar world. I think it's not uh, too ambition. They want to uh, a voice, a voice, or if you prefer, a democratic, more democratic assess in the international organizations. They want to participate in international system. Uh, they want a Chinese, they want an Indian uh, in the most important international organizations. They don't have it. So it's one of the uh, expectations that they want uh, in the process of uh, governal, um, governance, international governance. But India is like China in some way, because they have too much disparities in sight. There are a lot of uh, disparities between north and south. There are environment problems. They have human rights problems. They have conflicts, a lot of conflicts. There are thousands of conflicts uh, in China uh, nowadays. Now, my question to uh, Radha. Uh, there are a lot of more talk about, of course, about China. Uh, I would like to talk uh, or ask about the religious problems in India. Uh, the difference uh, between uh, groups in India, the problem of Pakistan, and if you can relate it with the relations of India and China, because the problem of the relations between China and uh, um, China and Pakistan, they have, this is a problem in the relations, tri tri triadic relations. The question for Professor Carvinho: the Portuguese language 
in the emerging world. It is important to have a Portuguese country in the leadership of the emerging world and of Portuguese-speaking, uh, yes, Portuguese-speaking countries and the, um, the Portugal in this process, the importance of Portugal, what we can learn about or gain with um, uh, the relation with uh, emerging countries. Two uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brother, would you like to, to begin? Sure. <laughs> very big, large, large questions. Um, the uh, religious intolerance question that has uh, dominated actually Indian political discussion for the past six or, or, or more months. I think that <coughs> there are two elements there. One is that uh, the coming to power of the present government with the enormous mandate uh, that they had did embolden uh, groups of Hindu extremists. They, they, they are referred to normally as fringe groups, and they certainly were fringe groups. I think that they felt that now there was this government, they could become mainstream groups. And we saw a lot of, well, not, maybe not a lot of social violence, but we definitely saw social violence, uh, both in the form of riots and in the form of a few, maybe only a handful, but still, murders in the name of this or that religious cause, uh, bans on beef and so on. But we also saw, and I must say I was surprised, we saw quite a, a, a quick and a very strong reaction. First from the intelligentsia, uh, then it was picked up by the electronic media, and it spread all over the social media, and uh, then it expressed itself in a major series of electoral losses at the state and at the local level. And all of this happened within six months. So I think on, on the whole, the outcome uh, uh, has been very positive and it's given me a great deal of confidence to see the way in which especially uh, the extremists were defeated at the hustings. It's quite interesting actually if you compare because you look at that uh, set of election results and that, that trajectory, if you like, of intelligentsia into media, into social media, into election uh, on one side. And then you see the other side, which is Marine Le Pen winning the, or do, getting leads in the district elections in Paris after the terrorist attacks. Or, you know, my old friend Viktor Orban taking Hungary into a further fortress-like situation, debates in many of the Eastern European countries on whether to close borders. I think it's a very interesting contrast, uh, uh, in, in, in a sense, on that. And perhaps uh, uh, one should imagine that India, which of course has a very long history of religious pluralism and living together, sometimes separately, sometimes in, in an integrated way, is fairly clearly still very much a part of the ethos uh, of the people of the country. Uh, on Pakistan, well, uh, you, you know, um, it's a mystery to me that we in India and also many in the international community, we tend to continue to see Pakistan as if it hasn't changed. But actually, Pakistan is a state in crisis, <coughs> and it's a society in crisis. And somehow, we never manage to talk about what, what can we do to help them come out of this old, terrible civil-military relations uh, uh, dominance problem. Uh, we haven't managed that international conversation at all. Uh, not with China, of course but we haven't managed it with uh, the US or the European Union. And here we would have very similar interests as, dem uh, you know, as democracies in trying to work out some policy towards Pakistan. Uh, of course, we all know the reasons. It's the usual real politic, 
nuclear armed state, critical to the success or failure of what happens in Afghanistan, critical to the success or failure of stabilization in Central Asia, critical to efforts to at least control the spread of uh, IS type uh, um, um, networks, which a French diplomat recently described to me as a franchise. I don't agree at all. I think that uh, the IS in Raqqa, for example, are not at all interested in franchising out to some little bunch in Afghanistan or Pakistan. But and if it happens, it's going to be ideological. It's not going to be uh, uh, based on the idea that, okay, you'll help in some way or another. But the point is that if we look at Pakistan as a state and a society in crisis, what are the options that are open to us to help alter? Uh, I fear that until we look at that, we are going to see the worst tendencies in Pakistan get stronger and stronger and stronger. And then by the time we get around to saying, well, what can we do to help? It may be much more difficult to evolve a policy. As far as Pakistan and China are concerned, I think that uh, many within the Indian policy and strategic community were very happy uh, to see China uh, saying that they would invest 46 billion uh, in Pakistan in building road and uh, other infrastructure there. Because they said anything that will stabilize Pakistan will be eventually in the Indian interest. Uh, whether and how this investment is going to materialize is not clear. Uh, China, I think, sees two opportunities. One, there's this huge international need for regional leadership for Afghanistan and within the Central Asian region. And China has stepped into that vacuum and I think is very welcome for doing so. Uh, the other uh, problem for China is the radicalism problem. And it's a very complicated one. I mean, uh, for us, for example, uh, the kinds of suppressive tactics that China has used in Xinjiang is something we cannot, we cannot support. And they keep saying to, to, for example, they've said to me several times, oh, but you did not criticize those knife attacks in Xinjiang. Why are you talking to us about Mumbai or about something else? And how are you to say, well, I'm very sorry, but if you allowed them to have their own language or to, you know, worship, uh, perhaps you wouldn't have knife attacks. Anyway, so for us, it's not only the, it's not only China's protection of, uh, uh, of, of Pakistan's uh, anti-India radicals. It's also that it's difficult for us to find a common ground to discuss radicalism on if we're talking, how do you tackle it? What are the reform initiatives and so on? Not clear to me how do we do this with China. Uh, and that's a real sticking point because, of course, we are very angry with them. Their behavior in the UN Sanctions Committee protecting this Hafiz Saeed who has uh, helped lead, if not support, <coughs> you know, <coughs> and if not direct uh, the Mumbai attacks is not something that can make anybody happy. But personally, I think there's a big dilemma there. I don't see what we can do with them. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The question was on how relevant uh, it is for Portugal, uh, the emergence of, of Brazil. Um, I think potentially quite relevant. There are various ways that uh, this relevance can, can manifest itself. One way which would be not very useful or interesting would be the way in which, uh, say, if uh, there is a village and from which a famous footballer comes and everybody in the village is very proud, but, uh, you know, is it really useful for the village? <laughs> Probably not. And so, you know, this idea that we have a big brother who, is, uh, who used to be a small brother, now he's a big brother, and uh, he's uh, talking to the big people of the world, 
that's not very interesting, but uh, what can be, of course, very interesting is uh, in that it can give us also access if, uh, if we know how to, to use that properly. And one way is, of course, through, through business ties. Uh, if Portuguese uh, business men and women are sufficiently uh, daring, they can, uh, they can make uh, a success in Brazil. And this will mean that Portugal will be not the only, but one of the countries in Europe to which Brazil is um, most uh, relevantly attached. Because I say relevantly because, of course, it has a historical attachment. But that is not very strong in the mind of the Brazilians in the 21st century. So it has, Portugal has to have a contemporary uh, relevance for, for Brazil. And we have to, it's a useful exercise for us to work out how to, to make Portugal relevant and to make the Portuguese economy and society relevant for Brazil. Um, CPLP is, I think, a very useful exercise for Portugal. It's also a useful exercise for Brazil, although, of course, Brazil pays less attention to it. I had the, the, the good fortune to participate in a number of CPLP meetings, ministerial meetings, and they were always extremely interesting because one of the characteristics, apart from discussing CPLP matters, but these meetings would always have a session of a couple of hours in which uh, the African countries, Angola, Mozambique, uh, from different parts of Africa, from Southern Africa, from West Africa, would explain about dynamics in their part. Brazil would explain about dynamics in South America. Portugal would say something about what's going on inside the European Union, and Timor-Leste would talk to us about the regional uh, dynamics of, of uh, uh, East Asia. And the result of that is an insight that is extremely rare to come across. So, uh, and that even for Brazil is, uh, is very useful. Brazil, the Brazilian ministers always learned a lot, and I know they always liked it because it's an easy atmosphere in which to be. But it has limitations unless it manages to go up to another plat plateau of relevance. And that is where the uh, policy makers in, in Portugal and the other countries should be uh, pleased to see that the new government in Portugal has uh, identified the CPLP as a, a, an area of um, a major focus for its policies. Because I think that it, this is, that is somewhere where Portugal can be relevant and it can be very relevant for Portugal. Okay, thank you. Uh, now it's time to open the floor to the audience. And if you agree, we'll organize the debate this way. Uh, we'll collect two questions each time and I'll ask you uh, to identify yourselves and uh, address your question as direct as possible. So the floor is yours. The first question is always the most difficult. Uh, first, uh, my first question was looking from the perspective of the emerging or emerged powers, new global players, perhaps better said, uh, what is the future of Europe? Uh, I raise this question. There is no Chinese expert in the, uh, unfortunately, there is in the room, but not in the table. Uh, I asked this question in China, and I said, how you see Europe in 2030? And Chinese has answered to me, we don't see Europe as a strategic partner. We see Europe as a very large economic space, still. But we see, we see Germany as a strategic partner. Is that the same for India, or is the same perceived from Brazil? What is the role of Germany, how it is perceived, and the role of Europe in the future? Is there a second question? If not, rather, would you like to reply to Alvaro? 
Well, India, I think, uh, perhaps unlike China, uh, never the, let the Indian uh, government uh, did not ever see uh, the EU uh, as a strategic player even though they signed a strategic partnership agreement uh, with the EU, I think, just after the EU signed with China. Uh, so, and they did have, I, you know, to some extent, traditionally they had a security partnership with France. Uh, it is certainly the case that Germany has emerged as a major player in India and as a, to some extent, a strategic partner. But uh, I'd put a qualifier in there. Uh, India does see the United States as a growing strategic partner. And it would, I, I believe that most in the policy community in India would feel that partnership with the US will and should entail coordination with uh, European powers as well. And they certainly would not want uh, a, a triangular British-American Indian. So uh, my guess is that over time, uh, Europe or the EU or whatever sort of mechanisms the EU eventually finds uh, for strategic relationship, will become a more important player for India. Thanks. Uh, of course, I'm paid to uh, talk about how centrally important the uh, European Union is for, for, uh, for everywhere. Uh, but uh, since I'm here in a personal capacity, I can, uh, I can uh, uh, relax and just reflect a little bit on the question. One point, I think, is, I mentioned this already, there is no sense of crisis of the nation state in the BRICS, and uh, this implies also, this implies also that uh, there is some difficulty, I felt this in India, I felt this uh, to a degree, feel this to a degree also in Brazil, in explaining how uh, the European Union can be a pole of the international system, particularly when they see very well established nation states like the United Kingdom or, or, or France or Germany uh, inside the EU, each with their own sets of relations with the, the BRICS countries. So there is, I think, um, some, uh, I would call it uh, an, an ideological difficulty in making use of what the EU can stand for. And uh, Avro, in your question, you, you mentioned Germany. Now, Germany is many things, but it is not a major security player. That is one thing that it is not. Uh, it is a major economic uh, uh, center of, of, of power. So what is it that Germany has that the European Union doesn't have? Well, Germany does have, obviously, a much more uh, simple mechanism of projecting itself, a much more consistent and coherent, because it is one country, not 28, way, uh, way of dealing with others. And I think that uh, over time, one of the things that will have to uh, materialize in the Europeans' external relations is uh, a much more linear, simple, capacity to identify two, three, four priorities in relations with major powers such as the BRICS countries. I think that uh, with respect to the BRICS countries such as those of the BRICS countries, China and India, which have, or the Russia for that matter, which have a very strong security focus, the capacity of the European Union to deal with them is, of course, much reduced. With Brazil, uh, I feel that it is much easier to work, uh, to develop uh, interaction between Brazil and the, the European Union than, than is the case, than has been the case with India. And the relations between Brazil and the European Union are very much less than what they should be, but that's partly a, a, fi a, a, a function 
of the fact that in the last seven, eight years, we've had a strong crisis in Europe, followed in the last couple of years with a crisis in Brazil, and the difficulty which the crisis produces of working in the international field. Because otherwise, I'm fairly confident that the potential of the relationship will develop very significantly, because the, the European Union can give Brazil, can provide for Brazil, um, a number of elements which it otherwise has to get from the United States. And it would rather go across the Atlantic and deal with us than be in a relationship which, in which it will be a junior partner with the United States. So I'm fairly confident about that relationship. The strategic question, though, is a question that only time will be able to, to answer. And there's certainly no consensus in, in Europe at the moment about whether the European Union should be a uh, strategic actor or not, but it, it can certainly be a very significant actor. And one aspect that I would, to finish, that I would like to, to point out, the Chinese, uh, I don't know exactly in what context they say this, but every week there is a Chinese delegation in Brussels dealing with something. Not necessarily from the military high command, but dealing with whatever, technology, education policies, water issues, urban problems. Every week there is, with India, with uh, Brazil, it's much more difficult to develop this intensity of relationship. But, uh, but with China, there is a very strong relationship there. I, if the Chinese don't call it strategic, maybe that's because we don't deal with, um, with the military side, at least not in a very relevant way. I wanted to actually take up one of your points on the um, strong sense or desire to be a nation state. Uh, as I've seen it in India for the last 20 years, we've been in a process of what I used to call willy-nilly federalization. Uh, but now I think that, that uh, what, what began inadvertently is now much more structured uh, uh, need to share power between the center and the states. Uh, it has taken the form primarily uh, of domestic power sharing, uh, not only at the political but you know, at the fiscal uh, level as well, which is where it always starts. Uh, now we see another phase of that, which is actually at the foreign policy level. You see that uh, increasingly the center has to work with states in order to improve relations with neighbors. Uh, with Bangladesh, for example, though the central government wanted to improve the relationship the West Bengal, our state of West Bengal, which is a bordering state, was an impediment until a few months ago when a breakthrough agreement uh, came about where we have now finally settled our borders and uh, uh, there are no enclaves of estranged people living anywhere. And that wouldn't have been possible uh, if the West Bengal government hadn't uh, come on board. Uh, the same thing we are going to see with uh, Sri Lanka, that if there is eventually a settlement of the Tamil problem, it will be because the state of Tamil Nadu will come on board. Um, and and uh, uh, Nepal, which uh, currently has a very difficult set of debates with India, uh, once again, uh, Bihar will, I believe, play an important role in helping settle that. So I think we're going to increasingly see our states playing a role in foreign policy. And actually, I mean, um, here I am sitting in Portugal. You have the distinction of having maintained a relationship with people in Goa. Uh, you know, one of the few, perhaps, uh, former imperial powers that has managed to keep a good relationship going. So that, that would be something that I would be looking at. By the way, I don't know how many of you know that India now has a uh, football league. And of course, Portuguese 
footballers are coming and training Indians, not only in Goa, but in Calcutta and all over the country. So if I were the European Union too, I would be looking more at the, as much at the state to state level uh, within India as at the central government level. Any other question? Please, there. Good evening. Uh, my name is Anna Luisa. I have uh, a question. Uh, Rada, you mentioned the lack of productive work for women in India. How is gender equality being envisioned in the national policies? Is there any strategy? Please. Uh, if you could elaborate on that. Thank you. Uh, well, again, it's, you have a central government policy, but the important one is going to be the states. Uh, because uh, if you look at the diversity in India, you have a state down in the south which has uh, a very high balance uh, in favor of women. You have a thousand seventy women to a thousand men in Kerala and you have a pretty good balance across southern states but you have terrible imbalances in the northern Indian states so primarily the equality question is going to have to be dealt with at the state level but the question that many people are asking is that should there not be some uniformity of law and order that a woman can turn to at the central level. It's one of those anomalies of our country that uh, in order to build the Union of India, the then founding fathers had to agree that law and order is a state subject. So in fact, the center legal constitutionally cannot intervene <coughs> even when there's social violence in a state. Uh, and many people have been saying that you've got to find a better balance for this. You have to have some central force. So that, that's one part of it. Um, education, uh, you did have a central government policy to up the uh, enrollment of girls in schools. And that was very successful. You now have uh, 50 to 51 percent girls in schools but they have not been so successful at the higher education level. Only 4% of Indian women are graduates. It's a staggering statistic, 4%. So here's something that needs to be, I think men is 10%, you know, to, be, to put it in context. But that's something that certainly needs remedying. Once again, I'd say that there, there's a stronger sense of entitlement. And what we see, interestingly, is that industry is beginning to talk about the gender deficit. So let's hope that employment will become a great incentive <coughs> for equality. Thank you. We have... A, there is another question there? Okay. Yes, sorry. Uh, my question is for Radha also. Uh, what about new approaches to world relationships? Uh, could there be a, a new path for developments? Um, for example, the relationship between Portugal and India, which is not widely uh, known and valued uh, nowadays in Portugal, for instance. What do you think about it? Could you repeat your questions, though? Uh, taking... Yes. Uh, I think, well, uh, you know, of course, uh, the uh, uh, government of India has always said that uh, Portugal was the only country that gave Goa back without a war. Uh, everyone else we had to fight with or we had to invade to take over. So you have clear, you know, whether it's true or not, you have clearly a pretty good basis for, uh, for a historical basis of relationship or goodwill or whatever to, um, to move on uh, with. I think uh, 
I, I don't know, frankly, to what extent governments are discussing this. But it seems to me the whole question of development of small towns into middle-sized towns that we see happening here is something with, you know, with a clean, uh, clean uh, environmental uh, approaches is something that could very fruitfully be shared with India. Uh, we have finally started talking about our coastline. We have many islands that are a part of India. The island-to-island -island set of connections could be one. Um, religiously, I expect that there are many groups scattered across the south and west of India that would have their own connections. I don't know about language. Uh, that's perhaps more complicated. Um, and as I said, football is the big thing <laughs> for, <laughs> for the youth of India today. I think we have, we had. <laughs> <laughs> question from Twitter. Can we see it again? But we can say the question. It was a question to João Cravinho. The first question from Twitter was for uh, João Crevinho. In your opinion, uh, what role can Brazil play in the current refugee crisis in the Mediterranean? Okay, thank you. Surprisingly, it does have a role. Um, but first, I should say that I think Rade is absolutely right. This is uh, football is something that the Portuguese uh, government needs to exploit much more. This was uh, something that uh, when, some years ago when I was in government, I tried to uh, convince the Portuguese Federation, Football Federation, but they weren't very interested. It's an enormous opportunity for us, and others have understood it. Spanish, uh, British have understood it very well. Uh, on the refugee crisis, Brazil uh, has a very, very large historic and, and also recent uh, Syrian Lebanese community, uh, probably 10, 12 million. It's, of course, always difficult to define when a Syrian Lebanese or when a person of any nationality, uh, after how many generations, uh, it ceases to make sense to talk about them as part of a community. But in any case, a very significant part of Brazil's um, uh, makeup is, is uh, from Syria and Lebanon from the former Ottoman Empire. This means that there is a lot of interest and concern about what's happening in Syria and uh, concern about the refugee population. Brazil has uh, said that it's uh, willing to take on uh, numbers which are relevant but small in, uh, in, in, in terms of the global of terms of the need, something like 12,000 at the moment. And we are working with Brazil in supporting Brazilian capacity to, um, uh, to, 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 to uh, uh, assess, assess the uh, visa requests in Istanbul and in uh, Beirut. So there is, there is something that is happening there. But the reason why I'm particularly interested in this topic is not just uh, to alleviate a little bit the pressure uh, of, of refugees coming, into, coming to Europe and across the Mediterranean. Uh, that's relevant, of course. But it's also part of a longer um, idea, or long, more longer term idea, which is the following. Brazil and the European Union, if we're going to be strategic partners, that means working on issues which are of relevance beyond the bilateral relationship, that are relevant uh, for, for global governance. I think the refugee problem, which at the moment has its epicenter in the Mediterranean, is a global problem for the next decades. And I don't know if the epicenter is going to be in the Mediterranean for the next decades. I don't think so. Probably what we see now in the Mediterranean, we will see 
in the, off the coast of China in 10 years or uh, in some other part of, uh, of the world. I think this is a characteristic of, of, for various reasons, a characteristic of the area in which we are, we are living. And therefore, I think it is extremely important to develop mechanisms of international partnership for dealing with uh, refugee crises. And that's why uh, I'm very keen to, to, to work closely with Brazil on this. We've already started, and this will intensify in the next uh, months. It's the same, uh, rather. There's another one. Uh, what is the place of the IBSA in Modi's foreign policy? Well, you know, um, uh, IBSA is India, Brazil, and South Africa. And actually, uh, if I'm not wrong, it, it was created as a kind of um, democracies within BRICS effort uh, that we would coordinate our policies in order not to be overwhelmed by China and Russia getting together and, and pushing their policies. Um, I'm afraid I agree with Joao that uh, BRICS was in a sense an alliance of convenience for a brief period of time. Uh, and we're going to see much more Russia, China on one side and then the rest of the countries going closer within their continents. I think these transcontinental links perhaps won't be so strong. Uh, as far as Modi is concerned, uh, you know, we, uh, the government of India tends to always say continuity above change. So we will continue with all the usual the non-aligned movement, BRICS, IPSA, we've now just joined SCO, so that will become more important. Uh, but I think that primarily it's going to be um, uh, India, US and India, China are the two big ticket items uh, thus far of Modi's foreign policy. The neighborhood is something that he keeps trying to, to get at. Uh, and just recently, we've seen another round of talks between India and Pakistan. So there's a hope that that may come back on track. What was very interesting is that unlike uh, previous governments, he wanted to dynamize the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation and to bring some level of regional economic integration back on the agenda. Uh, whether he'll be able to do that or not uh, is an open question. Okay. If there is no more question, I think we, we are now reaching our time. Okay. So, I'm sure that the debate will continue next month in the next conference, I think. But for now, uh, let me finish by uh, renewing my thanks again to the speakers, rather, João, and uh, to congratulate uh, uh, Alvaro Vasconcelos and the Fundação Serralves for this initiative. Thank you very much.